Welcome to the Water Resources Podcast. I'm your host, Bridget Scanlon, from the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. This podcast is produced in partnership with the National Academy of Engineering. In this podcast, we discuss water challenges with leading experts. It's my pleasure to welcome Lawrence Gill to the Water Resources Podcast. Uh, Lawrence, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, And uh, Lawrence is a professor in environmental engineering in the School of Engineering at uh, Trinity College in Dublin. And um, I attended uh, Trinity College in the late 70s where I studied geology. We're both in the museum building. He went up one stairs and and I went up the other side to geology. So it's really uh, fun to to talk with you today about water issues in Ireland. And um, Lawrence, maybe you can give our listeners an idea of uh, what type of uh, issues uh, you will be covering today and and related to your research. Yeah, thanks Bridget. Yeah, so um, I I describe myself as an environmental engineer, which I think kind of means I get involved in quite a lot of different uh, research projects. Uh, Certainly since I started in academia, I've had quite a sort of omnivorous uh, diet, looking at both air pollution, water pollution, hydrology, hydrogeology uh, type um, aspects. I, I suppose my research tends to focus more on field studies where we collect some instruments and collect a lot of data in, in the field. Um, uh, and then we, uh, you know, obviously bring samples back to the lab, analyze them, and then we develop a lot of mathematical models as well, which we then use to get further insights into the, into the processes. Um, I suppose my career f- for the first seven or eight years, I worked in industry in the UK designing wastewater treatment uh, processes. So that's what my background was um, when I first moved into academia. But um, through the study of more diffuse sources of contaminants, particularly septic tanks um, in catchments, rural catchments, I soon got more interested in um, how contaminants move through the through the soil down into the aquifers, got more involved in hydrogeology, groundwater engineering, um, et cetera. And, you know, I've moved in, I suppose many, quite a few different different directions um on route through academia so just following different in, in interests um i guess yeah well thanks uh, i really enjoyed reading many of your papers and uh, um particularly enjoyed uh, the uh, papers on air quality and whether you should ride your bike or you'd be exposed to more pollutants or take the bus and all of those practical aspects and really fun but today uh, we're going to focus on water issues and I'd like to talk about um, water pollution and linkage to agricultural sector and wastewater management. You mentioned septic tanks, also flooding issues, which are a big issue for Ireland and uh, linkages to between water and energy. Um, And and lastly, but not least, uh, is to discuss how you've been able to link science with the arts uh, through your music and and that program, which is uh, fascinating. so I guess first, um, let's talk a little bit about the general background of water issues in Ireland. I mean, most people think it's a pretty wet country. It just seems to never stop raining. And people ask me when they should go to Ireland. I said, well, you know, you, you never know. <laughs> You've just experienced a month of uh, fairly dry weather. And today it's lashing rain, you said. <laughs> it certainly is, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the whole of June was incredible. I, I think it's barely a drop of rain. But now now it is, <laughs> it's making up for it today, I can tell you <laughs> Um, and so uh, a lot of when I look up um, background information, I mean, 85,000 kilometers of mapped rivers, 12,000 lakes, uh, and uh, most people um, use surface water as their source of uh, drinking water, 80% of the population, I think, and, and 20% on groundwater. Um so when I was doing my studies in the U.S. early on, I studied karst hydrology, uh, and that's water and limestones and stuff, because I thought I would go back to Ireland at that point, and uh, 40% of Ireland is uh, karst systems. Um, so looking at uh, the Environmental Protection Agency reports uh, about uh, water quality issues, uh, they mentioned that about 40% of the river sites uh, have high nitrogen levels and um, and rivers and groundwater and estuaries in the southeastern uh, part of Ireland are under high pressure from intensive agriculture. Um, maybe you can describe uh, that a little bit, um, Lawrence. 
Yes. Yeah, so, um, so to give this sort of background to some of the legislation in Ireland, um, as part of the EU, uh, we're very much working to something known as the Water Framework Directive, um, uh, which was came into force in 2000. And um, ba basically what it was asking was that all EU countries, that every river, lake, transitional water, estuaries and groundwater should get to what is known as a good status. That's good um, ecological status, good chemical status by the year 2027, which seemed quite a long way away in, in 2000. But of course, that's just around the corner now. And as as you mentioned, in, in Ireland, for example, in, in terms of the water and, and the rivers, still 40% of the rivers are less than good status. And we've only got a few years to go. So, you know, realistically, this is it's not going to happen at all. All the water source, all the water bodies are going to get to good status but there's you know th th there's been this kind of structured uh approach setting up river basin management plans on these six-year cycles to try to target sources of pollution and improve the the, the status i mean a, a lot of the a lot of the focus has been on nutrients and um a lot of, really the, the majority i i I believe of the nutrients going into the aquatic environment is coming from uh, diffuse sources of agriculture. So ag agriculture is, a, you know, it's 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 a um, a big industry in Ireland. Um, I suppose one of the things that differentiates Ireland from many other e EU countries is we don't have this legacy of heavy industrial pollution that a lot of you know countries like UK or Germany, for example. Have so that, that you know there's not from a research perspective there's not much uh, to study from that perspective but it, it's much more um, my focus and a lot of other researchers here is on the more diffuse uh, sources of pollution from human uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, as, as well but um, particularly from um, agriculture and um, whether it's uh, from fertilizers being put onto the land or from you know animals on the land um, and their feces etc. Right. And uh, so uh, when I was looking at the European Water Framework Directive, um, it's a good status in terms of ecological status and water quality. It doesn't mention water quality, quantity. I didn't see mention of water quantity, but do they consider, uh, you know, water scarcity issues also? Or um, They certainly do things like, from a groundwork, I, I, I work quite a lot on them. Um, groundwater fed uh, ecosystems like wetlands and uh, uh, fens, turlocks, et cetera. And from that perspective, the quantity is certainly um, take, taken into account, you know, that, that's keeping the ecosystem alive. Um, but you're right. Yeah, in terms of the rivers and lakes, I'm not so sure that is, um, it's, it's not something I've worked on actually, but I, I, I don't think that is taken into account so much. It's, it's more the chemical quality and then the ecological quality. Right, right. And uh, what's nice about the European Framework Directive is they talk about uh, scoping out the issues in the first phase and trying to figure yeah. out what the extent of the problem is, then looking at approaches to mitigate the problem. And then the third phase is evaluating uh, the success of those uh, strategies. I think that's a really nice, logical step-by-step uh, -step approach then uh, yeah. to, uh, to evaluate these uh, problems. So you mentioned, you know, the linkage between nutrients and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus issues in the, the surface water and groundwater um, and um, primarily sourced from agriculture. But uh, looking at the exports uh, from Ireland, um, uh, 12 billion, I think, in 2020 or 21, uh, 2020, 80% uh, 80 of those exports are agricultural products. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that, uh, so that's like almost 10 billion uh, is agricultural products. And as you say, we're, we're not a big industrial country. Uh, and um, interesting also is that uh, three and a half billion to the UK, uh, yeah. which is um, must be a little <laughs> bit difficult these days with uh, Brexit. Um, so I assume, you know, the farm lobby is uh, pretty strong in Ireland. It's pretty powerful politically. And so... And then on the agricultural side, they're promoting expansion of agriculture, uh, food harvest uh, program in 2020 and food wise program in 2025. So on the one hand, you have this push to expand uh, agriculture, more intensive, more cattle, more fertilizer applications. On the other side, from the environmental point of view, then you're, you're trying to deal with the aspect. So it seems like there's kind of a disconnect there uh, in, in what's being promoted to, from the agricultural side and then what you're trying to deal with on the environmental side. Yeah, I mean, there's, 
definitely a tension between the um agricultural industry etc and 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 the envir environmental um protection um it is a very strong lobby um at the agricultural um community and there's some very very strong um you know rural politician i mean rural politics in, in ireland is um is quite quite a thing um uh, um and you know as i i work a lot on these diffuse sources of pollution you know this quite it takes quite a while to kind of understand some of the dynamics that are going you know I, i've lived in cities all my life but you know the, the, the thing what is important to people in rural communities and as i guess we'll come on to talk about in a minute you know a, a good percentage of of uh, the population of ireland lives in rural or semi-rural kind of um types uh um environment and you know agriculture agriculture supplies a lot of jobs um uh and so that that is very powerful and and also the agriculture, agriculture and the Department of Agriculture funds a lot of um, research, which is kind of pro-agriculture, as it were, you know, trying to make things better. But um, equally, there's a lot of research funded by the Environmental Protection Agency, which I tend to get my funding from. And, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely, there's no doubt about it, there has been conflicts and different interpretations, let's put it that way, of, of, of the same data um, that are coming out, which... Uh, it, it makes it interesting but i mean th there's no doubt about it that the agricultural community are you know have been changing and, and are trying to do things in a more sustainable environmental manner uh but at the same time they, they don't want to reduce their outputs and as you say if anything they they, they they've they been increasing um the intensity of farming but i mean there, there are clever ways to increase the intensity and maybe not increase the environmental um pollutions but that's that's what's going on at the moment you know there's there's various different angles of research and uh that that are looking into these um types of things but you know from any from the, the water perspective uh, you know our rivers still aren't good and um haven't really improved that much over, over the last few years despite a lot of effort into so-called programs and measures um that have been set up um, for, by these river you have these individual river basement management plans that are set up in six-year cycles to try to uh target you know bespoke plans for different catchments to try to target um pollution and, and improve the matter but it's so i mean so far it's been pretty minor i think the the successes um, or right the right and i mean we've been hearing a lot in in the netherlands and surrounding countries about uh, uh impacts of uh, intensive agriculture on environmental quality here there so i think it's similar issues here and um, I grew up in a farm in 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 Kerry in Southwest Ireland, and uh, they kept the cattle indoors uh, in in the winter, and then yeah. there was land application of manure in the yeah. spring, and so those sorts of things. Uh, uh, but it seems like uh, most of the farmers these days have degrees in agriculture, and <laughs> so it's a, it's a much more sophisticated operation, and there are a lot of regulations that they're trying to abide by. So I think they're trying to improve. So you yeah. mentioned, you know, maybe it hasn't improved that much i mean are they doing uh riparian buffers next to the stream to try to yeah 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 i mean there's a lot of I, I mean i think another issue in ireland that maybe say people in the states wouldn't appreciate is the size of the you know there's lots <laughs> of very very small farms you know people with cattle you know 20 cattle 50 40 cattle it's that scale you know and lots of them so um i suppose it makes it a bit more difficult to regulate when you've got so many different people that need, need to be contacted, uh, etc. But you know, as the younger generation are coming through, there's no no doubt about it. About it, they're much more environmentally focused, um, um, etc. And and yeah, riparian buffer strips are, are, are a big tool um, that's been um, introduced um, for with various degrees of success except, um, o over the years to try to improve um, the the discharge you, quality you stuff, again, yeah, right. yeah, directly into. Um, yeah into rivers i mean forestry is, an, an, is another issue that has been targeted um we, we have very little decision you know natural forest but there's a lot of um coniferous sort of kind of sick, sick of spruce type forestry that's you know um in, industrial uh forestry and uh there's been quite a lot of work on the pollution from that particularly sediments and then you know how, how to improve that so the, i mean certainly the last 20 years i mean a lot of research and activity in trying to understand the, the pollution and pollution pathways and um and then actions following from that 
Right, right. And when you mentioned the size of farms, when people here in Texas, where I live now, asked me, you know, <laughs> what, what what size was your farm? You know, I'm embarrassed to say, well, it was like 70 acres. And they just think, oh, my gosh, that's just like your backyard. You know? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With the and, I mean, like, on one level, you know, from biodiversity level, it means there's a lot more hedgerows, you know, et cetera. Uh -huh. um, but uh, from a regulation, it does make it kind of trickier, I think, with so many kind of individuals right. with small farms to 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 deal with right right uh, so uh, another aspect of uh, pollution that you uh, do a lot of and which benefited and leveraged from your work in the uk your early uh, career there is looking at wastewater and um, i guess considering the population of the republic about five million and maybe another two million from northern ireland and uh, much of the area being rural you mentioned earlier that a third of the the people rely on on-site wastewater treatment and uh, the centralized water treatment is uh, mostly secondary treatment, but then the on-site treatment and how well that works and what that is contributing to um, uh, ground uh, to water quality. Uh, maybe you can describe that a little bit. I think Ireland was fined by the EU for E. coli early on, um, you know, for some of their um, discharges and stuff. So maybe you can describe that a little bit, uh, Lawrence. Yeah. So I mean. When I first came to uh, work in academia, because I've been working in these large scale um, wastewater treatment plants, and that was my interest. Um, there was a project by the EPA on septic tanks, and there wasn't much else in terms of research funding available, and I applied for it. And I, I thought, well, septic tank you know, sounds a bit boring, <laughs> you know. But, um, but actually, you know, the more you get into it, you know, how the effluent goes down through the soil, you know, through the unsaturated zone down into the groundwater. I mean, it, it just opened up this whole world of um in um in interest etc and um uh so i mean ireland is is incredible in terms of the geology the, the, the diversity of the geology and 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 the soils you know due to previous periods of glaciation um um etc so that it's just endless the sort of fascination in terms of the different permutations of of what can happen but about one third of the population in, in ireland um uses some form of on-site wastewater treatment and the, the majority of those probably 85 percent is a septic tank and then the effluent goes into the into the grounds and so i i spend a lot of time researching how it should go into the ground you know how it should be spread out evenly for different soil types such that as it percolates down through the soil you get a uh, treatment of uh, potentially path pathogenic bacteria and nutrients um etc and also trying to minimize greenhouse gas uh, emissions is something we've been looking at uh, a lot more recently um looking particularly more at the microbial diversity of, of what's going on in the soil and how we can kind of tweak that to minimize greenhouse gas emissions and also optimize the pollutant removal capacity of soils so there's a couple of issues um one of the main issues really in ireland is low permeability subsoils uh, particularly up in the northern half of the country so that the last period of glaciation um uh, uh left left kind of heavy boulder clay across a lot of the country which is very very low permeability so what that means is the a lot of this land can't even take the rainfall let alone this ad additional wastewater that's been um discharged into it so um it means a lot of the effluent, uh, you know, go through very shallow pathways, probably directly into um, a lot of streams in, uh, into watercourses without being treated. I mean, the soil itself, if you get unsaturated, you know, one meter of unsaturated soil, which with reasonable per 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 permeability, it can be, you know, really excellent treatment treatment uh, medium. So if it's done correctly, it, it's it's a very effective, very sustainable form of um, sanitation. But um, in low permeability scenarios, we have to sort of rethink it. We, we've been doing a lot of work recently trying to enhance evapotranspiration using like willow trees, for example, um, um, as a as, as a concept to lower the the load on the on, on the soil. Um, and then in, in in some other parts of the country, we got far, too fast. You know, percolate in in down in the southeast, it's it's potentially too fast, and that can lead to think particularly things like nitrate pollutions in in the, in, in the groundwater um, underneath. Um, so yeah, the, so on site, like, you know, I sort of ignored it, I guess, when I was younger. But I mean, it's estimated about three billion people on, on the planet use some form of on site uh, sanitation. So you know, the more work I do into this, the more I, 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 I think. I mean, it's, first of all, it's fascinating, um, and it's you know trying to use 
uh, passive treatment, nature-based type type solutions, you know, uh, um, as as much as possible, um, in this very kind of dispersed environment where there's you know there's very little regulation. Your average person doesn't spend ages maintaining their septic tank. So these types of things have to be very kind of robust, um, uh, etc. So it's 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 very interesting area of study, and then that that very much led on to looking at um, contaminant pathways. Um, through, you know, if you find, say, groundwater has been um, uh, contaminated, where, where has the contamination come from? Has it come from agriculture or has it come from human wastewater? So the human wastewater is, as a source of contamination, is more worrying from a disease perspective because um, most diseases we catch come via kind of humans. I mean, there are some that cross species, but uh, most of the big ones come directly from human effluent. So we've, we've done quite a lot of work looking at, you know, contaminant pathways from septic tanks versus agriculture and then various types of um, um, risk um, analysis on 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 those at a kind of catchment level etc and then and how, how can we mitigate that impacts and so um, so just just in terms of the I know you said the statistic that 80 percent of people in in Ireland use surface water which is I mean there's no doubt that, that that's true uh, it's it's kind of disproportionately affected, I think, though, because Dublin is by far and away the largest city, and Dublin we, we're right next to the Wicklow Mountains here, so there's big, you know, reservoirs effectively up there that that, that supply the whole of Dublin with surface water. But in rural areas, you know, the use of groundwater, particularly kind of single wells for individual houses, is 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 much higher, you know, in, in rural areas. Yeah, I know. Growing up, we had our own well, but then we, yeah. after a while, maybe when, uh, you know, 10, 15 years, we, we linked up with more of a centralized system, but we still yeah. had the, the well as backup. Uh, and um, uh, so you, you also do research on trying to fingerprint the source of, of yeah. contamination. Um, maybe you can describe that a little bit. You mentioned human and animal sources. And, you know, I read sometimes about uh, cryptosporidium outbreaks in uh, West Ireland or different regions. And, yeah. uh, you know, so maybe you can describe that a little bit. Yeah, so so it's the sort of traditional measures of um pollution is say if you take you know somebody suspects their well their private well um is polluted they might take a water sample and they test it for e, e. coli or you know sometimes ammonia and nitrate and and that can certainly give you an indication that there might be some sort of fecal contamination but what it doesn't do it doesn't tell you where it's coming from because mammals and birds produce e coli and produce you know, nitrogenous waste so what we've been trying to do over the years is to look at more specific uh, compounds that we can say look we, that must have come from humans um, and therefore not from agriculture or, or vice versa so cert, some things we've looked at are things like caffeine um, pharmaceuticals uh, you know which are obviously synthetic um, artificial sweeteners that you know used in foodstuffs and um, uh, drinks instead of sugar because they 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 um, they uh, they they don't break down very very readily in the environment um, Another thing is fecal sterols. So when we break down cholesterol in our body, we break it down to a certain byproduct. Um, whereas a pig, for example, breaks it down to a different byproducts, and then a cow breaks it down to a different byproduct. So by looking at these kind of ratios of 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 these um, degradation compounds, we you know we have some you can say like that must come from human effluent, um, etc. Uh, another one for for fluorescent whitening compounds, and um, these are that used in detergents um, and this is quite easy to, to monitor for. So um, again, we've used those in, in different situations. Some of these are better or, or worse. I mean, the, the problem about things like caffeine, pharmaceuticals, artificial sweeteners are that they're, they're costly, that they're, they're expensive to, you know, analyze for, and it's quite costly and you need very specific um, machines, but um, something more recently been quite exciting about um is the sort of, you know the sort of rise and ease of molecular biological techniques like dna sequencing etc um we're starting to do a lot more work looking at very specific microorganisms um that we know must come from a human versus um versus from from a cow or a chicken or something so that there's uh, bacteroides uh, as a species of bacteria some are very specific to humans some are specific to cows and then more recently uh, at the moment, we're doing trials um, today, actually, um, where we're, we're dosing Tabasco sauce into septic tanks uh, uh, fields. So when you eat peppers, there's, there's a virus uh, called a uh, peppermotile virus that and, um, infects peppers, you know, normal peppers that we eat. 
and it's totally harmless to humans, but humans, but it goes goes through us. And um, so we're starting to use this as a as a tracer. So if you pick up the pepper, it must come from some sort of human food source, etc. And um, you know, the aim is to see how you know when it goes down through the soil, does it get bound up in the soil? Uh, or, or you know, or is it more mobile and makes its way down into the groundwater, etc. And then we hope maybe you can use that as as some form of tracer. So we do a lot of research on on this type of um, aspects, uh, specific compounds. How do they break down as they're coming down through the soil? How persistent are they in in relation to maybe more pathogenic forms of um, uh, pathogenic organisms uh, that we're really worried about? Um, Right. In, yeah. In, in, in uh, it, it's it's funny, you know, people ask, you know, do you drink coffee or not? But it maybe even without uh, <laughs> explicitly drinking coffee, maybe drinking it in the water and you were getting the caffeine in, yeah. in, yeah. in the in the water. Um, and um, so so that's that's extremely interesting because, I mean, in order to treat the problem or deal with the problem, then it's important to understand the source. And then it may be that your septic tank is too close to your well or or, yeah. you know, maybe need to be um, locate the well in a different place to avoid the, the, the pollution. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, the water governance uh, aspects and uh, uh, the European Union and the Water Framework Directive that was uh, uh, established in, in about 2000. And uh, then the Irish Environmental Protection Agency was created in uh, the early 90s, 93, after passing uh, the Act in 92. Um, and so, um, uh, and then also Irish Water was created in uh, in 2013, Ishka Aaron. And um, and then in at that time period, they were talking about charging for water. And I can remember the uproar <laughs> there was. <laughs> uh, maybe yeah. you can uh, describe uh, that a little bit of uh, what Ishka Aaron or Irish Water is and, and uh, what they were trying to accomplish and, you know how that has evolved yeah so the, the i mean you know it seemed like a good idea at the time um um you know every county local authority had their own they you know they they dealt with their own wastewater and 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 drinking water said so, you know they had their own engineers and etc dealing with that and you know some of these these counties are very small by international standards so you know so i think it made sense to get a uh to, to, to centralize this expertise etc to take over the running of the centralized water and wastewater treatment works um but, but and when it was set up the idea was to um charge people you know for for water as happens in most other countries really um uh and in the urban areas they went around putting in um water meters um which again you know seemed like a very sensible thing to do to be able to quantify how much water people use and then you know one of the key things was to be able to identify leaks and then to notify people, well, either Irish water themselves to know about the leaks or to identify, you know, tell people on their land, on in their property that there's a leak and can you do something about it? Um, but it was, I think it's fair to say it was kind of poorly um introduced in that it was just it was just seen as an additional tax. Well, it was an additional tax, you know, there was no it was extra money people would have to, to to spend on water without seeing the benefit on the other side because i mean like we all pay for water obviously we pay it via central taxation but it's not a direct um cost and um so i think i think about six months nine months they did charge for water but as march's demonstrations all, all you know and it was very contentious and in the end they that they rolled back on it and um so we have irish water and we have all, all the water meters which are still being read and um, which are very useful from a data perspective um but we're not getting charged directly for water um so you know there is this there is this kind of misguided notion with some people that sort of you know water is free and should be free i mean it's, it's not free i mean there's a massive infrastructure if, to produce water coming into your tap and also just as important and more importantly from my perspective the, the wastewater so you know when you flush your toilet how it gets treated etc and, and that wasn't sold very you know that wasn't explained very well i don't think at all um at the time um but anyway, um, that, yeah. that happened. So we don't pay for directly for water, and it, and it mean you know really it means it's still very underfunded. I I I believe that the water sector um, in right. Ireland. 
Yeah, I was looking up some of uh, the aspects related to that, and it seemed like they were going to provide about a, a certain baseline amount for free, 80 litres per day for free mm -hmm. per person. Uh, that would be 20 gallons per day. And then above that, then they would be charging maybe 0.5 cents per litre or two cents per yeah. gallon. You know, uh, but I do remember that one of my siblings in uh, in uh, Wicklow um, installed a well at that time because she had a, a fairly large family and so was concerned that, uh, yeah. you know, all the showers, et cetera, uh, you know. So it was an interesting time, but it's nice that you have the legacy now of all these water meters and then yeah. you can quantify how much water people are using and, and changes in demand and... Um, so that's yeah. important data to have. So, uh, yeah. and I mean, uh, it, it also, I mean, at the time, it, it, there was a lot of debates about rural versus urban living because, you know, people with centralized facilities would have to pay for water, whereas people in, in the country, like you say, with, with wells didn't. And then there's other debates about, oh, how much money people were spending on roads versus. So it opened up a whole kind of can of worms in, in, in the country, really about, you know, the proportionality of taxation. What, what do we pay for? And, you know, when we live in different places. So yeah, it was quite contentious, and and it, and it's interesting. I mean, like, for example, in Denmark, um, if you if you live in um, in the country, say you have a septic tank, you have to pay um, a fee to the government tax to discharge your effluent into the soil, um, because it's deemed as you know a form of potential pollution, um, and that led to a lot of people just designing closed basin evapotranspiration willow treatment systems, um, not from a uh, uh, not from the perspective that they well, that we have, where we have low permeability soils and it won't work, but that they did it from a financial perspective. Um, to so that so they they argue well, there's no discharge into the soil. Um, whereas now we're using th these types of basins to uh, in areas where the, the the soil is is too too low permeability to take the effluent. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there's a lot of discussion uh, these days about uh, social vulnerability and uh, mm. and water access and water being a basic human right. And, and we had a Nash Academy discussion maybe about a year ago, and uh, they were uh, pushing forward uh, Ireland having free water being a very advanced. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I you know, of course, it's a, it is definitely a human right. And, and, you know, I think South Africa was one of the first countries that introduced this, you know, this certain amount for free and then this kind of rising scale, you know, as you use more and more um you get charged proportion and you know of course you don't want people cutting back on the amount of water they use from a health perspective but at the same time you know you want people to feel that you can't just leave taps running non-stop and it doesn't matter um so that i think there's a balance there somewhere right right uh so we've talked a lot about water quality issues and linkages to agriculture and uh, wastewater and on-site wastewater treatment systems but another big issue in Ireland in terms of water is uh, flooding. I mean, everybody thinks of Ireland as being a very wet country, and that's why it's so green. Uh, but uh, one of the issues with that then is uh, flooding. And I was just looking at uh, the Irish Times, and they said um, one of the headlines just recently was Tralee hit by biblical flash flooding a few weeks ago in June. And uh, and uh, then, you know, various years where you had a lot of flooding. Maybe you can uh, describe uh, that a little bit, um, uh, Lawrence, and, and, and what uh, they are doing to try to alleviate uh, some of these issues. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it seems, I guess, alongside a lot of other places in uh, Europe and probably the world, that the frequency of severe flooding is increasing and, you know, it's been attributed to changes in the climate, um, et cetera. So, I guess in Ireland, the two main sources of flooding is uh, fluvial flooding, um, particularly from some of these very low permeability type catchments, very fast runoff off the soils. Um, that is that's probably what was going on down in Tralee. And then groundwater flooding, which is something I, I work on um, uh, a lot. So I, again, kind of, sort of legacy for me from working in industry in the UK, I, I used to do a lot of modeling of sewer networks when I first came here, um, uh, one one of the academics here had was working on cast systems, and he, you know, we had this idea that we could model these these underground conduits using the same principles as uh, pipe pipe networks, because you, you know, uh, unlike most kind of groundwater systems, uh, you, you know, you get turbulent flow through these the, the, these pipes. So I started to work on. Um, uh, 
mathematical modeling of some of these systems that are out in 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 the west so we have we have we have cast as you say you know across probably half the country but some of the more recognizable areas of cast are um certainly in in the west um you know a lot a lot, a lot of our cast is underlain by quite is is low low level low, lowland cast and underlain by quite uh heavy deposits of soils it's not maybe as uh spectacular as um some places you might see in europe or america but but we, we do have places like the Burren, which are, you know you have the more kind of classical cast uh, scenery but the the lowland nature of a lot of our cast systems means that um uh, we do get quite a lot of uh, groundwater flooding where the, the 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 water level come to the surface from from these cast um, systems and uh, flood the lands now the the, the flooding, the speed of flooding is much slower. Uh, the rise, if you like, of the flood walls is much lower than the sort of more fluvial flash floods that you get. But it, but it, it hangs around a lot, lot longer. So from a kind of damage perspective, you know, it, it, it it's more um, insidious, I guess. It, it, uh, and uh, so, in in a in quite a lot of cast areas, due to this lowland nature, we we have these lakes, these ephemeral lakes, which are known as turlock. So turlock in Irish means um, uh, dry lake. So in in a, in the summertime, it's 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 like a, a field, like an empty kind of bowl of field, and you know cattle graze and etc. But then in the winter time, um, the the system underneath you know becomes overpressurized, if you like, um, and surcharges up into the um, into the basin and creates these lakes and then there's turlocks and these things bounce up and down according to the, the the rainfall and and when we first started doing this we were looking at the ecology because you get very unique vegetation that can sort of tolerate these fluctuating conditions flooding conditions um but of course under and really extreme rainfalls these the and, and you know everybody knows where these turlocks are and you know you, know, you, you wouldn't build a house in the middle of a, a turlock because it would flood every year but in extreme conditions these you know go beyond their, their normal boundaries and create groundwater flooding and this seems to have been getting worse over the last 20 or 30 years in, in some areas so there's a, a particular area in south galway with some very big conduits under, underneath the ground you know very big cave systems and you know many many turlocks at the surface that we've been studying for well i've been studying for 20 years but it's been going a, a, a long time and um we're using these models that we've developed now to develop um uh, uh flood alleviation systems so once you get to certain levels uh having these overland bypass channels that take the water down to the sea more quickly to sort of take the top off the flood um such that you, you know the area isn't flooded for sort of two uh, t uh two months at a time um so this is, I mean, this has been going on for quite a long time, but it looks like we're getting closer and closer to this and uh, getting past planning permission, et cetera, and actually being built. I mean, you know, we, we don't want to interrupt the ecology. We, we, we do want the, the systems to flood and have the same kind of ecology. Um, but in these really extreme periods, um, you know, it, uh, we don't want to be flooding the people's houses and uh, railway lines, et cetera. So it's a, it's a very interesting project. And then there's all issues about, you know, taking flood waters directly down into the bay and how that impacts on the um, the the, the uh, aquatic life in, in, in the marine. So trying to, you know, we're having to model the, the marine environment as well. So it's, it's all very interesting. Um, uh, so... Uh, so there's, you know, there's there's two agencies. There's one, the OPW Office of Public Works, that looks more uh, that they're they're involved in flood, sort of flood risk assessments for rivers and groundwater, and then the Geological Survey of Ireland, they specifically more on, on on the groundwater size. And you know, over the last many years, they've been coming up with flood risk assessments for different parts of the country. Um, um, you know, designating some lands as you know. What one in a hundred years did this might flood? One in fifty years this might flood, um, etc. Right. But the, the cast systems are so kind of specific that it, you know you need. It's very difficult to have a kind of generic um, model for them. Um, I think. Right. Well, you definitely see the linkage between groundwater and surface water in those areas. I mean, mm. oftentimes, you know, we manage those systems separately and they're very siloed. But I mean, in, in that system that you just described with the water table rising and then creating this ephemeral lake, you can see that there is a, their groundwater and surface water highly connected. And then yeah. with the car system, it's kind of like an underground river system. And so uh, mm. it's easy for people to understand uh, uh, how groundwater is somewhat similar to surface water. So 
these are nice examples. And and uh, yes, I mean, uh, it's nice that you are maintaining the ecosystems and stuff, but then also dealing with the, uh, the excessive flooding and trying to drain that off and then considering potential impacts on the coastal waters. Um, yeah. So uh, there's a lot of discussion these days on um, energy issues in Europe and with the war in Ukraine and shortages and all of that sort of thing. But um, in Ireland, uh, you were describing uh, some of the linkages between groundwater and energy uh, with the example in Trinity of those um, uh, heat pump wells that are uh, installed in front of the museum building. Maybe you can describe that a little bit, uh, Lawrence. Yeah, so I mean, in in terms of say, you know, the push for renewable energy here, I mean, the the main um, thing has been wind energy um, over the last twenty years. So that can supply up to about thirty percent of the electricity, and there's more plans for wind turbines out out, um, you know, deep, deep deeper offshore, um, etc. Um, but you know, really, it only targets the, the electricity it produces electricity. But in terms of the heat sector. The vast majority of our energy is from um, gas and oil and um, to some extent coal. That it, We used to burn some peats as well, which I guess we can come on to in a minute, but um, uh, that, that, that's been phased out. So um, there's a sort of nascent uh, interest that's now building in terms of geothermal um, energy in Ireland, which I'm starting to get, I'm starting to get very interested in, and as, as are other, uh, others. Um, I, and... You know, I think realistically for most of Ireland, we're talking about quite low entropy type systems, shallow, shallow uh, you know, geothermal. We don't have hot rocks close to the surface like they might do um, in say, Ireland or Italy, although there, there possibly some potential up in, in the north of Ireland. But, uh, you know, I think in general, we're talking about relatively shallow, maybe down to a, a kilometre or, 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 or shallower type systems. And it's just starting to be looked at more seriously in a few large scale projects. Um, for sort of more district heating type um, approaches are being uh, have 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 starting to be constructed and, uh, and designed. So here, here in in Trinity, um, there's a you know Tr Trinity is a very old university, 1592. It was um, set up, and um, there's certain areas that you think would be hallowed ground and never be touched, but um, just outside, which there's a little square outside my my, my building. Uh, that Bridget knows very well and um, you know it's been dug up over the last two years and they've drilled 22 meter um, uh, wells um, geothermal wells down to 180 meters and then these are these are now going to be heating um, two quite two big accommodation blocks old accommodation blocks um, uh, that they've only just been switched on literally a few weeks ago um, even in, in the summer so we haven't really tested them yet but that's the idea so it's it's great, you know. It, 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 we get some um, data, and I'm I'm interested in sort of modelling the, the groundwater side of that, um, and also, you know, in the more kind of suburban areas, we've got tight amount of land. You know, can, can we realistically use some of these shallow geothermal type ground source heat pumps um, as a concept? I mean, there's quite a few people use them out in in more rural locations where they have you know bigger um, gardens or areas, etc. But um, it's 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 something I I, I think there's going to be an increasing amount of activity in in the next uh, few years. Right, and so maybe you can describe that a little bit. I mean, so you is it a closed loop system in Trinity then that's planned, and do they put the yeah. water underground then and then the ground uh, uh, heated in the winter then and then uh, circulated in the the buildings then to heat the buildings in the winter. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a closed loop system, so you you're not using the direct water from an under underground so there's a, a a heating fluid goes down into the ground which picks up the heat the small amount of heat from the groundwater and comes back up and then that goes through a heat exchanger um which transfers the heat into the water that then goes into the radiator system in the um in the building now in in some scenarios you can have a so-called open loose system where loops it where you're actually taking the, the the water itself you know from from the groundwater um up Take extracting the heat, and then you then you have to inject that back down somewhere else. The cold water, you know, obviously away from the the source where you're picking up the the, the hot water. So it it depends on the the nature of the groundwater um, as to which is more effective, and you know which, which should which should be used. I think. And and theoretically, you could use that also for air conditioning if it gets too hot in the summer. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> not normally a problem here in Ireland. Well, you never know with uh, 
<laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, another, it's interesting because, again, you know, I see things from a sort of Northern European perspective and, we, you know, we always worry about our main energy uses in the winter for heating. But of course, in other countries, it's, uh, you know, maybe in Texas, I, I don't know, uh, air conditioning is is one of the main energy um, uh, uh, uses in, in hot weather. Right, right. And so there's a lot of um, discussion then about energy sources and that has been changing in Ireland, as you mentioned, you know, increasing wind energy and some of the statistics I was looking at, almost 50% still relying on natural gas and some electricity power plants uh, based on oil and uh, but uh, in recent years, then they've been um, uh, closing down the uh, power plants that were using um, uh, turf, uh, Bordnamona, um, uh, ESB uh, closing down these in one slated Eden Derry, I guess, is slated to be uh, phased out uh, this year. Uh, so maybe you can describe that a little bit, but people can still go to a bog and, and cut their own turf and, and store that turf for uh, household heating, but not any industrial use. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Um, so in Ireland, um, particularly in the Midlands, we have these lot, lot where we used to have a lot of raised bogs that you know developed over ten thousand years of accumulation of the the moss, the sphagnum um, growing. And I think from about nineteen forties, I mean, and people have used that in rural locations that, that, that they cut the turf, dried out, and and burn it. It's not amazingly efficient as a heat source, but you know it's. It's there and um, it's it's available, um, but then a state company was set up called Bordnemona to industrially harvest these bogs in in the Midlands, and um, did that over you know se several decades. I, th I think in the nineteen sixties it was providing up to about forty percent of the um, electricity in Ireland, but I mean the last 10, 15 years it's been down at about eight percent of the electricity, you know, natural gas and oil have been by far and away the the, you know, the, the, the major suppliers of um electricity but um it's been you know it's been deemed uh to be not 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 great from a um uh, both from a climate perspective um and, and also from an ecological perspective by the way i mean it, it, there's vast tracts now um of the midlands are just these blank you know uh, uh excavated peat, peatlands with almost no vegetation um, growing on them. So um, last year, the government decided to, to stop all industrial um, harvesting, and um, they've set up a, a scheme known as PCAS, um, Peatlands Climate Action Scheme, uh, to try to re reverse this and and bring these to to try to get these peatlands to start to grow again. Basically, to re wet the peatlands so that they start to the sphagnum, the moss starts to grow again, and starts to lock in carbon. Um, which is very slow progress process, but um, also you know start to uh, generate proper natural bogs with, with all the biodiversity uh, benefits. So um, this company, Board um, and now calling themselves a climate solutions company, um, uh, and you know they, they have this extensive scheme to um, to rewet all the, you know these thousands of hectares of. Um, excavated peatlands and we're, we're now starting to do a lot of research into this as to how you know how do you hold the water back you can do it via bonds blocking drains etc but what is the optimum conditions for the sphagnum to grow so you can't dry out too much in, in in the winter otherwise it will die and you know equally it can't be flooded too deep in in sorry can't dry out in summer uh and can't be too deep in the winter so there's so there's this kind of sweet spot um that's needed to to try to regenerate this um this type of um the, this uh, vegetation um once it gets established it, to an extent creates its own kind of micro hydro hydrology but in the first you know 10 to 20 years it's going to be tricky to to get get this fragment to grow so so you know i work a lot on this kind of eco hydrology um and it, it, it's very interesting um you know trying trying to uh and trying to get the right hydrological conditions and then you know trying to model in but, model what's going on and then you know tweaking it etc tweaking the, the, the different levels to try to optimize this and does this uh, provide work also for some of the people that are working in, yeah. in the local community so that that's an interesting aspect also yeah so i mean i think you know the, the government's um you know spending a lot of money on this re-wetting of the bogs and you know it certainly is helping you know from a environmental sustainability perspective but i think it's also 
it's it's also about the local economy because again in the midlands uh you know a high number of people are involved in um this industrial harv harvesting of the peatlands you know directly employed by born ammonia and then all the subsidiary com companies that provide machinery etc and so suddenly stopping that um you know would put a lot of people out of work so now these people are employed in reverse you know using the same machinery but to, to build buns and, and block drains um etc um and you know it provides employment um over maybe a short relatively short period but at least it you know it's kind of softens that blow if you like in in these uh, communities in the midlands um, so we've talked a lot about hydrology issues, and uh, I was extremely impressed uh, with uh, your uh, program trying to combine science with the arts through music and uh, uh, the Inception Horizon, uh, and also uh, watched uh, the uh, performance in the museum building, I guess the day before lockdown, and then uh, the film um, and the cast performance in Slovenia in a cave. Maybe you can describe that a little bit, Lauren. So it's extremely impressive and what <laughs> motivated you to do that and you know and and how it yeah well I suppose where it all comes I mean I, I I play a lot of music in my spare time I mean a lot of it's kind of traditional music not not just Irish music but I play a lot of sort of French Italian and and you know music's very important to me and I sing in a choir etc but it's always struck me that you can hear a piece, piece of music that you hadn't heard since you were sort of five years old and straight away you can remember the tune or the words it comes straight back to you whereas you know i, I give it a lot of lectures to students and i can guarantee two minutes after they walk out of the lecture theater that they can't remember a thing i've said so i've always been interested in that can we somehow combine music um and, and other forms of art to help people to understand certain concepts um scientific uh, uh, uh concepts or, or or any concepts really and um and I suppose working with cast, I, I had that idea, you know, can, can we somehow write some piece of music that um, mimics, you know, the rain falling onto the land, how it percolates down, maybe through the soil, through the um, uh, through the epicast, down into the conduits, um, you know, to getting faster and faster, more and more kind of um, um, joining up together, and then eventually coming out in, in a spring um, somewhere. And I, I, as I say, I sing in a choir as well, and the the person who runs the choir, uh, the artistic director, got quite excited about this, and so she 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 took some of my words and, and composed this uh, piece of music called Inception Horizon. Um, and you know, I took the whole choir and we went went down some caves in in, in the borough, not not tourist caves, you know, proper caving caves, and um, and you know, it was about two years of sort of um, building up to this and writing. I was I was writing the lyrics and she was writing the music, and again, the, the pace of the music somehow. It kind of drops, uh, the pitch drops, mimicking the water dropping as you come through the system, and and then and it but speeds up, uh, you know, as 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 the flows are getting more and more um, uh, combined, and um, so so we had this in, in the music, this amazing building that I work in the museum building. Uh, just we'd arranged this event, uh, um, a public perception event on cast. So it wasn't just this piece of music. There was a, we had poets uh, speaking. We had scientists, geologists, et cetera, giving talks. We had um, uh, different visuals, you know, different projections onto the, onto the wall, onto the stone. And um, it was lucky because it, it was literally the day before we, we shut the whole country, shut down. COVID had just, there's just been a few cases and um, it was the last day. Uh, and anyway, so we had this big, um, this uh, event and, and the culmination of this was giving, giving the, the world premiere of this um, choral piece of music. Uh, which went down re really well um and then we always planned to, to sing this in a cave as well somewhere and originally we were going to do it in Ireland but then of course lockdown changed everything for a couple of years um but I, I work a lot with people in Slovenia you know Slovenia is one of the centers of kind of research into cast they have the so-called classical cast in a generic cast in the Balkans and um and uh they, they got very keen about the idea the idea could you know could, could the choir come across and, and and sing the piece of music so so we we um we all went over there in this september last september uh, uh to perform the piece uh which was amazing in these spectacular caves and then the other thing we did was uh, there's a unesco earth futures festival um where we had the the recording of, the, of us singing the music and then uh, i took a cameraman into 
some of these caves in the Burren and we captured footage and we put together a film that kind of cut between uh, us singing in our um, sort of posh, <laughs> uh, posh clothing in the museum building and then the underground um, scenario working our way through the cast um, uh, system following the flow of the, of the water um, in, in time with the music. And um, so we submitted that into this competition and it, it came third overall, um, um, which was which was great in the people's pop popular choice. So, you know, it's been really interesting, but it's, I mean, it has been effective, you know, it's definitely got more people interested in, in understanding how water flows un under, underneath the ground in, in these systems. And, you know, I'm involved in some other kind of art science type collaborations now um, on the back of that. And, and it, you know, it's apart from being enjoyable, I think it is worthwhile from an educational perspective. Right. And, uh, you know, I think the UN uh, last year, had the uh, main issue was uh, they focused on groundwater and uh, a title was Making the Invisible Visible. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, certainly Karst uh, helps us understand uh, some types of groundwater systems. And then I really admire how you have been able to bring these uh, two things together, science and the arts. And uh, we will include links to um, these various okay. things on the on the website so people can access them and listen and watch. Um, so you've been working in Ireland for a couple of decades now, and you've been trying to deal with the challenges with water. How, how do you see the future evolving? Are you optimistic about the future and think that we'll be able to cope with uh, all the, in the increasing climate extremes and things like that? Or, um, I mean... I mean, I'm quite optimistic as a person anyway. I, I, I think, you know, there's much more knowledge and information and tools available, you know, tools in terms of uh, um, analysing contaminants or mathematical tools or, you know, computing. Power. I mean, it, it's it's unbelievable the speed of uh, change, I think, in technology, et cetera, over, over the last 20 years. I mean, maybe people would say it has been for the last 100 years, I, I guess. But certainly since I've been in research, you know, what we know now, is incredible so you know if we have knowledge and we have tools to be able to do it um i guess the, the final part of the puzzle is convincing people who have control of the money to put resources into solving these problems but you know i i, I am an engineer at heart and I, I believe we can solve probably we we create a lot of problems of course environmentally but i think we have the ability to to, to solve a lot of these things i mean it is slow i mean environmental processes are so you know as we've seen in in the rivers there's big lags in in, in the system so you know that is problematic i think politically sometimes in that you don't necessarily see the results very quickly although we have a big project at the moment trying to date groundwater in ireland and really it's all about nitrates because there's been a lot of work in trying to reduce nitrates in groundwater and yet they don't seem to be reducing so you know how, about how long is the groundwater hanging around there before it gets flushed out etc um but i mean just with the knowledge and the, the, the tool i mean you know we we have much better insights and than we used to, and but and also the more you know, the more you realise you don't know, of course. Um, so I, I feel fairly optimistic, um, but undoubtedly there's big challenges, and, and of course you know the, uh, the predictions for Ireland as a lot of places is more intense storms in the winter and less uh, rainfall in in the summer. So you got droughts on one side and you know floods on the other. Um, so, but you know once we have an awareness of that we can you know um try to mitigate these the, the, some of the consequences of, of, of that well i agree with you and uh, i think you use satellite data a lot for the, yeah. the looking yeah. at the bogs and uh, and and how they are changing over time so we have a lot of uh, new tools and and I like talking to engineers because they're solution focused and it's not just uh, uh, all, um, you know, crises and but uh, trying to come up with uh, appropriate solutions. Uh, I really admire your work and uh, appreciate all that you're doing. Uh, I look forward to visiting Trinity in August and hope we can get together. And yeah, our guest today is uh, Lawrence Gill, who is a professor in uh, engineering at uh, Trinity College Dublin. Um, thank you so much, Lawrence, uh, for uh, discussing these issues. Okay, have a good day. Thanks, brilliant.